Assembly. We're so glad that you've joined us again for our Wednesday night Bible study. Let me go ahead and take this moment to remind you now is the perfect time to share this post, to share uh, the video to your family, to your friends, uh, to the more church family that uh, has not yet joined us. So make sure to tell them that Bible study has begun. And uh, we also want to remind you that after Pastor is done speaking to us tonight, to hang on for just a few announcements, including what's going on with the church in April. And uh, we just want to keep you as informed as possible. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll jump right into Pastor's teaching tonight. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for an opportunity that we have to come together as a church here online. I pray that your presence will enter into all the homes and the spaces where people are watching Lord, we thank you that your presence is with us wherever we are, that you go with us. And God, we just ask that tonight that you will open up our eyes and our minds and our ears to hear and to see and understand what it is that you are speaking to us tonight. Lord, let us receive it. Let us apply it to our lives. Let us be changed through this teaching. We pray your blessings upon each household in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, join me as we hear Pastor Daniel teach. Well, good evening, First Assembly God family. Here we are once again, ready to get in the Word and learn and grow and be strengthened and encouraged. And so I invite you to uh, get your Bibles, get your paper and pen if you want to take notes and gather your family together. Let's get into the Word of God this, this evening. It's a good day. It's a good day to serve the Lord, and we're thankful for His many, many blessings. One of those blessings is that He has made provision for us to be able to be together through this means. I know it's artificial, but we're going to make the most of it, and we're going to rejoice, and we're going to uh, declare His Word with power and with uh, with authority and anointing. And how many knows the, the Bible says that His Word will not return void? And so the Word of God going forth is going to do something in your heart and in your life. We believe that, and that's our faith. So we're rejoicing with that. And this Wednesday evening, we usually gather around. We just finished our study on God Speaks and listening to the voice of the Lord. But this this evening, I, I felt led of the Lord to share with us this teaching. We may finish it today. We may not. We don't know. We're just going to jump right into the Word of God and see what the Lord will do. I, I've, I've noticed something as you read the Word of God, as you meditate upon the, the dealings of God with his people from the Bible all the way back from Genesis throughout, that how many times God raised up an intercessor when the people had faced impending judgment and the, and, and the land was, uh, was in a time of crisis. God would raise up a man or a woman. God would raise up a person who would be an intercessor, who would stand in the gap and make up the difference. I'm not about to pronounce that what we're seeing happening in our world today is God's judgment. I'm not about to say that it's because of this or because of that. I will say this, that all human suffering is the result of original sin. We live in a fallen world. We live in fallen bodies. And things like this happen in a fallen world where sin has infected and sin has destroyed. And so it is a result of that. But nonetheless, we can learn that a person can make a difference. You can make a difference. And if there's anything I want you to get out of this study tonight is the difference that you can and should be making during the time in which we're living in, and really at all times, but now more than ever, we can be making a difference I've entitled this teaching today, Priests Unto God. Priests Unto God. Now that may sound a little bit uh, awkward for somebody to say, I am a priest, because we have a mental image perhaps of what a priest should look like. Maybe we come from traditions where the priest is uh, a person that wears a certain kind of clothing. Maybe they have long beards. Maybe they have special headgear. They, they carry themselves in a certain way and they're kind of up here and we're down here. But one of the tenets of our faith is that we believe that we are all priests unto God. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. And as we consider that, we consider the priesthood of all believers and we consider our ministry, our priestly ministry, yes, you, as a priest unto God. As we consider that, we understand that it is really the work of intercession 
that is directly linked to the office of the priest. The priest in the Old Testament time as God revealed him unto us was the one who would stand between a holy God and a sinful people. They would stand in the gap. They would kind of be the, the intercessor between a holy God and a sinful people. And our ministry as priests unto God is, in, is really in the area of intercession. When we place ourselves in that posi position of standing between God and man in order to uh, intercede on behalf of other people. So we learn some things here from the Word of God. Number one, uh, Jesus is our only mediator. That means that He is our great high priest. But that does not mean that believers cannot also be intercessors. I want to take you, of course, to the Scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 6, a great anchor Scripture for what we're talking about today when I call you a priest unto God, we're all priests unto God. Now, that may be shocking to some people. I know if you come from certain religious traditions, that may just seem like almost blasphemous to say it. But it is biblical. We are priests unto God. What does that mean? So 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings, be, be, be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And how appropriate those that admonition, that in, exhortation, that instruction is to us today. We need to be praying for those in authority and in leadership over us. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But look at verse number 5. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. So there is one God, but then the Bible tells us that there is one mediator between God and man, and it is the man Christ Jesus. And the emphasis there on the humanity of Jesus is so that we can take comfort in knowing that when Jesus intercedes for us, when he mediates on our behalf before the, the God of heaven, before the Father, he is doing it in his humanity as well as his deity. The emphasis wants to make sure we understand that this is the man Christ Jesus. Now that's important because uh, there is only one mediator of salvation. Now this does not mean that we cannot pray for others, that we cannot intercede for others. The mediator between God and man is talking about in the, in the sense that Christ and Christ alone is the one who dispenses saving grace. That there is no one else who can stand before us and God and plead our salvation and be our mediator. Sinful man can only approach a holy God through the righteous Son of God, Jesus Christ. So that's what it's talking about. But the question would be asked, if Jesus is the only mediator, does this mean that believers cannot be intercession, intercessors? And I would, I would uh, challenge you today that when the Apostle Paul said that there's only one mediator between God and man, he is talking about in God's salvation plan, that there is salvation in no other but through Jesus Christ. And so uh, he is the one and he alone is the one who imparts saving grace unto his people, the one who dispenses that. But he is a great high priest of a new priesthood. This is very important for us. He is the man Christ Jesus, and that's important too. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16 says this, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith. Listen to this. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things 
as we are yet without sin. So there we have it. The reason that the Apostle Paul told us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that the mediator is the man Christ Jesus. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us that we have a great high priest who can sympathize with us. Why? Because he was tested and tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He can sympathize with our weakness because he knows See, no, no human being can point a finger of accusation to God and say, God, but you don't know what it is to live on this earth because there at the right hand of the Father stands the man, Christ Jesus. No one can point a finger of accusation to God and say, Lord, but you don't understand. But you don't understand the pain. You don't understand human suffering and, and the things that we go through here on planet earth and in this frail body because we have a great high priest who can sympathize with our human weakness. Why? Because though he is, was, and always will be fully God, 2,000 years ago he became a man. And in heaven, he not only is God, but he is still the man. He took his humanity with him up into heaven. And there he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us, not only through his deity, but also fully in his humanity. And that ought to give us confidence of knowing that's why the apostle says in Hebrews 4, 14, uh, 4 uh, 16, Therefore, because we have a high priest who understands human weakness, who has suffered as we suffer, who was tempted as we are tempted, who understands all of these things, sympathizes with us, he says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace and help, in the time of need. So there's a promise for us. But you know this passage reveals that not only is Jesus our intercessor. But we likewise are invited to share in the priestly ministry of Jesus. And to be able to intercede on behalf of others. To be able to approach the throne of grace with confidence. With confidence. And that's a good thing. So we're looking at the fact that. Jesus is the great high priest, but he is the great high priest of a new priesthood. You know, the Bible gives many, many titles to Jesus. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And I could say today that he is the high priest of priests. Uh, and he is the, uh, the, the, the one who uh, stands as the, as the first but there are other priests, and we are all priests unto God. You know, Job had a prayer in Job chapter 9, verse 33 to 35. It's a prayer that was answered as, you know, he was going through his struggles and his suffering. And he didn't really understand. His understanding, his knowledge of God was limited. And we know a lot more than Job did because Job was actually a contemporary, many believe, of Abraham. So he was before the, the Pentateuch was written, before any of the written revelation of God. But yet he feared the Lord. But he said this. He said, there is no umpire between us. He's talking to God. There is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. Let him remove his rod from me and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear, but I am not like that in myself. So the Job in his suffering he said, oh, I, I, I wish, I pray that there was an umpire between, between man and God. Someone who would lay his hand upon both of us. That gives us a great picture of the high priestly ministry of Jesus, but also the role of the intercessor, the one who stands between God and man and prays. This priesthood, as I said, is not just limited to Jesus. Now, he's the only one that can save. He's the only one that can forgive He's the only one that can impart grace and salvation unto man. He's the great high priest. But he's the great high priest of a new priesthood. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it tells us this. You are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. Now I want to pause right there. Because as we read and understand the Old Testament, there were three offices in the Old Testament that God established and through which God ministered unto the nation of Israel to lead them during those times. One 
was the king. One was the priest and the other was the prophet. And probably the prophet came first, but nonetheless, prophet, priest, and then king. Prophet, priest, and then king. And the priesthood, of course, was established uh, first off by Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. But we know that there was a priestly order even before Aaron and the Levitical priesthood because the Bible tells us of Abram when he came before the priest, the, the, yes, the, the priest of Salem, the, uh, the Melchizedek. So there was a priesthood even outside of that order. But there was a prophet, there was a priest, and there was a king. And these three offices by God's design were kept separate. In fact, one of the sins that caused so much damage to Saul, Saul was the king of Israel. He was the king of Israel. And you remember after a victory against the Amalekites, he decided on Mount Carmel to not only set up a monument for himself, but then he also came and he began to sacrifice animals. Well, that was the job of the priest. And the king took upon himself the, the job of the priest. And when he did, Samuel the prophet came and he said to him, What is this bleeding of, of a sheep that I hear? What have you done? And Saul had taken upon himself that role. So God kept those offices separate. We know that the king came from the tribe of Judah and the priest came from the tribe of Levi. And the two were never to be in one. But here we have a wonderful revelation that Christ has now made us a chosen race and a royal priesthood. In other words, a kingdom of kings and priests. So we are both kings and priests in the sense that Christ has extended that to us. A holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Not only First Peter, but, chap uh, but Revelation. Revelation 1.6 uh, Jesus said this, He has made us to be a kingdom, priests to His God and Father. He has made us to be a kingdom, a kingdom of priests to His God and Father. To Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So that's the title of this study, Priests Unto God. Priests Unto God. That does not mean we need to go buy robes and we need to dress a certain way and try to somehow or another... Uh, think that we're better than others, this type of thing, you know, put our hand out for people to kiss it, that type of stuff. All of those man-made things that, have, uh, that man has created in his religiosity, that's not the biblical thing. That's, that's not the spirit of Christ that we somehow or another assume a, a position or an attitude of spiritual superiority over anybody. We're not saying that. We're no better than anybody else. Christ has redeemed us and he can redeem anybody who will put their faith and trust in him. And when he redeems us, he makes us a royal priesthood. He makes us a kingdom of kings and priests. A kingdom of priests. And priests unto his God and Father. So when we look at the priest and what is primarily the duty, primarily the function of the priest, we can see that the priest had many functions, but the one that is most applicable to us today I think is the fact that the priest in the Old Testament was charged with the continual uh, maintaining the fire upon the altar of incense, continually burning. And upon that altar in the morning and in the evening, the priest was charged with the duties of pouring out the incense upon the altar so that that place would be filled with the sweet aroma of the incense that was poured. The Bible tells us in Exodus 30, verse 7 and 8, that Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense. Every morning when he dresses the lamp, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, that's at, at night, he shall burn incense upon it. Listen, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. What a wonderful picture of the calling of God upon our lives as priests that morning and evening and perpetually, that's why the apostle said, pray without ceasing. Let us keep the fire burning and let us keep the incense 
perpetually before the Lord throughout all our generations. And so the altar of our hearts should be always burning and we should be continually morning and evening and every point in between pouring out our incense upon that altar so that it will rise to God like a sweet aroma unto his name. Now God has never been satisfied, has he, with mere ritual or religious repetition. God sees the heart. And I'm so glad that he does. That's one of the things that we probably need to learn during this time is that God sees our heart. And we get so consumed on the mechanics. We get so focused on the outward display of religiosity and how we do it and how we do it if we do it right. And this is the right way. That's the wrong way. This is better. That is better. And we sometimes just go through the motions and we might even pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I did it. I did it according to the book. I did it according to the letter of the law. And But our heart is not in it. Our heart is not in it. And friends, we must never be satisfied with just the mechanics. We must never be satisfied with just going through the routine with God. But God sees our heart, where our heart is. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 13, I failed to put that scripture in my in my uh, passage here, but Isaiah chapter 1 and 13, the Lord talks about that. And Exodus, uh, where am I here? Isaiah chapter 13, the Lord is not pleased with the vain repetition. All right, but God is not pleased with it. Look in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. And when you're praying, Jesus is speaking to the people. He says, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetitions as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So that's a great admonition there that we have got, God looks at the heart. So we want to keep the incense burning. We want to keep the prayers going. We want to pray without ceasing, but we never want to do it in just a, a routine way. We've got some script memorized and we just run through our script. And sometimes we know that there are churches that just repeat prayers almost mindlessly by rote. They may repeat them 20 times, 50 times, and the more times they repeat them. But, you know, God sees the heart, doesn't he? And they may not be focused. They may not, their heart is not in it. It is better to talk to God out of the simplicity of our hearts and just tell the Lord our burden and share to him what we're going through because ultimately God sees the heart. Now, somebody might be tempted to think that because of this and because of the Old Testament passages that we have and the altar and the incense, and there are still people in, in other religions, not in Christianity, I hope, but not in biblical Christianity anyway, who might think, well, we gotta, we got to burn incense. And, and that's, that's our offering to the Lord. Well, the, the incense was symbolic, but when you have the substance, you no longer need the symbol. And the symbol, incense was the symbol, but the substance is prayer. So now that we have the, 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 uh, the, 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 the substance of what this uh, sweet smelling fragrance is unto God, we no longer have to do the symbol. So I'm not advocating, I don't think it's proper for us to go to the Old Testament and say, well, see there, we got to burn incense. No, we got to pray. That's what we got to do. Burning incense was for them because they not yet had the new priesthood that we have in the people. So the priest would do it in representation of the people. But aren't you glad today that because of Jesus, we now have access to God and we can now pour our incense upon the altar of our hearts. And that incense is, is not the, the physical incense, but it is our prayers that when we pray to God, it is heard. The incense in the scripture was often associated with prayer. David said this, May my prayers be set before you like incense. He said that in Psalm 141 too. In John, when he had his vision of the elders around the throne, the Bible tells us in Revelation 5.8 that the elders were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Isn't that reassuring to know that our prayers just don't just kind of vanish out there somewhere. Our prayers, somewhere between heaven and earth, between earth and heaven, our prayers are transformed into that incense 
that the 24 elders are pouring out upon there in the golden bowls and the elders are pouring out our prayers like incense before the throne of God. So what a wonderful, wonderful vision that should encourage all of us in our prayer ministry that your prayers are being being heard, that your prayers are making it into the very throne room of heaven as they're converted into this sweet-smelling incense. As, as I said before, don't go buy incense. Don't start burning incense in your house and say, that's my devotion to God. No, pour out your heart. Pour out your heart. The Old Testament, the incense was a symbol, but now we have the real thing. We have the substance. And because we have the substance, we don't have to mess with the symbol. Amen? We don't have to mess with the type because we've got the real thing. And so that's why we don't do it today. But what we do do is we pray. We pray to God and we pour it out. Revelation 5.8, eight. Well, passage of scripture we just read. They were singing a new song and, and there they said uh, that they... Uh, they took the uh, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. But if you keep reading in Revelation 5, 8, in verse 10, it says, You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. They is talking about us, the redeemed of the Lord. They will reign upon the earth. They are a kingdom of priests to our God. And that's what I want to remind you today. You are a priest unto God. And that's a great thing. Revelation 8.4 talks about the smoke of the incense, which is the prayer of the saints, prayers of the saints, went up before God and out of the angels' hands. So we have a beautiful image. They're demonstrated not only in the Old Testament worship, where the priest was charged day and night to keep the fire burning and the altar ascending to heaven, but then we have a revelation from the throne room of God. John the Revelator saw it and he came back and reported to us that our prayers are filling those golden bowls and they're being poured out upon the altar in heaven and our prayers are like incense. They, they, they are a sweet-smelling aroma unto God. That's a good thing. The priest stands before God in representation of the people. An intercessor literally stands between two parties. An intercessor advocates to one on behalf of the other. So as priests unto God, we have an intercessory ministry. And I think now more than ever, as many of us are uh, perhaps sitting at home, maybe you're not able to work, maybe you're working from home, but nonetheless we don't have a lot of the other distractions and amusements that we enjoy, nothing necessarily wrong with them. But we, we don't have them. There's nowhere to go. You know, gas is the cheapest it's been in a long time. And that's, that's good. Um, the only thing is there's nowhere to go. So, you know, it'd be a good time to do a trip. But there's, uh, that's not advisable. That, not, that would not be wise during this time to just be out and about having a good time. So we're home and we think, what can I do? Well, you're a priest unto God. And what you can do and what I can do is that we can be intercessors. And I want to challenge and encourage you to use this time to really stand in the gap and be an intercessor. All right, what are some characteristics of a great intercessor? I want to give you just a couple, and we may not finish tonight. That's okay. We'll pick up next week. Prophetic eyes and ears. We are kings, priests, but you know what? Jesus was the first. That was a king, a priest, and a prophet. And he has now made us not only kings, priests, but he has also made us to be a prophetic people. He's made us to be a prophetic people. Would that all God's people, uh, Moses said, would, would be prophets. Would that all God's people would prophesy. And Joel said, I will pour out, God said I, in the last days through Joel, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And the Spirit of God the, 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 is, is, makes all of us to be a prophetic people. And as prophetic people who are doing their priestly uh, ministry, we need prophetic eyes and ears to understand the times and see what is happening and what will happen as a result of what is happening. We're in a world right now, there's a lot of uncertainty there's a lot of worry. There's a lot of confusion. 
uh, I think we have to be gracious to our leaders and to the medical professionals. We want answers and we want them now. But the truth of the matter is that nobody truly understands what is happening. Nobody has it all figured out. This is new. And, and everybody's doing their best, I believe, to do what is right. But nonetheless, there's a lot about this that we do not know. But I will tell you something. Though God may not reveal to us every detail because He knows we cannot bear it, the Lord will give us understanding of the times so that we can know what is really happening. And I think that if ever there was a moment that the church needed understanding of the times, we needed prophetic eyes and ears, it is right now. It, to be able to know what is really going on. That everybody is kind of losing their head. But Christians shouldn't be that way. We should be rooted and grounded in the light and the revelation that God gives. And we should walk with confidence knowing that God, uh, that this has not caught God by surprise. That man may not know everything about it, but God does. And not only that, but God reveals unto His people what they need to know in order to be prepared and in order to be victorious and in order to pray effectively. I'm reminded the Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, that the sons of Issachar were men who understood the times. We need an Issachar generation. We need an Issachar anointing upon the church right now that we will understand the times. Listen, with knowledge of what Israel should do, so they, they were men who understood the times and they had knowledge of what Israel should do. And we need to pray for that. Lord, if you anointed the sons of Issachar, if you gave them understanding of the times and knowledge of what your people were to do, Lord, we pray that you will do that for us as well in this hour in which we live in. So we need to be intercessors that have prophetic eyes and ears. I think that it is no coincidence that since January, or maybe before, I can't remember, we've been on Wednesday nights talking about hearing from God. Because let me tell you, if ever there was a time when God's people needed to hear and to see and for God to reveal knowledge unto His people, it is right now. Because, as I said, the world is confused, the world is lost, but God's people have revelation. We have light we have a God who is speaking unto us and opening our understanding and showing us what we need to do during these times. And so be very, very attuned, be very, very sensitive to that and seek divine wisdom and understanding. Amen. In Ezekiel 33, we're talking about prophetic eyes and ears. I want to read this. It's a little bit lengthy, but I want to read uh, out of Ezekiel chapter 33. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon the land, and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own hands." He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken warning, he would have delivered his life. See how important it is to have watchmen, to have prophetic people that God will reveal and speak to and show them what is happening and maybe, and, and not maybe, but even what is to come. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned, and a sword comes and takes a person from them. He is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. So there it is telling us that we have a responsibility to be watchmen on the wall. To be prophetic people who are listening. Who are receiving from God revelation and understanding and instruction. So that we can tell people what they ought to do. Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. You will hear a message from my mouth. That's good. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak and warn the wicked for this way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. 
But if you do your part, warn a wicked man to turn from his ways, and he does not turn from his ways, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. And so there we see how important the role of the intercessor is in these times. Let us have prophetic ears and let us have prophetic eyes. Let us be able to see what is truly happening beyond the smoke and beyond the mirrors and beyond the human opinion that God would show us not only what is happening, but God would show us what we are supposed to do and that we will be able to share that with others and in so doing save their lives as well. I take comfort from a passage of scripture, Amos 3, 7. I love this and I, I, I can't share the entirety of this testimony. But three years ago, the Lord spoke to me. It was very similar to, I remember when the Lord told Joseph or revealed to Joseph about the seven years of abundance and then the seven years of famine so that he would prepare and so that the people would be spared. And three years ago, the Lord spoke to me and, and challenged me that we needed to do something to prepare for a day like this. And I didn't understand it. You know, Jesus said, I have much more to say to you, but you cannot bear it now. And I think there are times that God doesn't show us everything or tell us everything we want to know, every detail of it, because we couldn't bear it now. So I had my ideas of what maybe the Lord was talking about, but I w walked in obedience and did what he said and positioned myself in this church so that now that this is happening, I can look back and say, you know, the Lord prepared us. The Lord spoke to us and the Lord in some way revealed to us, not, not, not the details, don't, don't, I'm not trying at all to say I knew this was coming. I'm just saying the Lord uh, somehow or another gave us enough knowledge, enough revelation so that we would not be caught completely off guard and unprepared for what is happening. And I claim a promise in the scripture, I remind the Lord of it, Amos 3, 7. The Bible says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. And I have claimed that and I have seen it demonstrated in my life. I'm going to tell you, when this is all over, I will share the entirety of that testimony. But it is wonderful and it's, a ble it's going to bless you and bless a lot of other people. Because God, uh, God knew this did not catch God by surprise. God knew and he in, in one way gave me enough knowledge of what was, what was coming so that we would be prepared, and, and we are, and God's going to help see us through. And so God does nothing without first revealing his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So we've established two things. Number one, Jesus is the great high priest, the only mediator between God and man, the only one who can dispense salvation, the only one that can dispense grace, the only one that can forgive sins is Jesus Christ. Amen. Man cannot do it. You don't have to go to a priest for him to absolve you of your sin. Jesus and Jesus alone. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And no other man can do what Jesus can do in saving and in forgiving and in cleansing us from our unrighteousness. Jesus is the great high priest. But Jesus is the great high priest of a new priesthood. You know, Jesus is called in the Bible the great shepherd of the sheep. But we have pastors. He gave pastors. But all of the pastors are under pastors, under shepherds. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. That's why the psalmist said, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Well, just as Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep, and all of us that serve and be called and be given to the church, we are under shepherds. Well, Jesus is the great high priest, and all believers who've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, all believers are priests of this new priesthood. Jesus is the great high priest, but we are priests unto God, a kingdom of royal priests, a kingdom of a royal priesthood. So we, we establish that Jesus is the, the great high priest. We are priests unto God. And in our priestly duty, what do we do? We pray. And when we pray, it is like when Aaron poured out the incense on the altar and day and night it ascended unto God as a sweet smelling fragrance. And likewise, we pray. And when we do our ministry of praying, how should we do it? We should do it 
with prophetic ears and prophetic eyes, allowing God to reveal to us what is happening and what God's people ought to do in response to what is happening. We're going to close right there. I, I don't want to make these teachings too long, but we have much more to share with you and we'll next week. But I just want you to grab those truths. We are priests unto God. We are priests of a new priesthood. And Jesus Christ is, of course, the great high priest. And when you pray, I hope that this will encourage your faith to pray with greater boldness and to pray with greater fervency, knowing that, hey, we are priests unto God. And my priests don't just go as far as the sound of my voice. My prayers, my prayers don't just go as far as the sound of my voice. My prayers ascend into the very throne room of God. And somewhere between here and there, my prayers are turned into incense and they fill the golden bowls and they're poured out on the altar and heaven is filled with the aroma of the prayers of the saints. Isn't that a good thought? Well, God bless you tonight. I hope that this will encourage you to use this time that we're shut in. Let's make it shut in with God and be safe with Him and be protected. Use this time to really, really begin to operate in our priestly function as intercessors and as watchmen and as those who will stand in the gap and cry out to God, cry out to God on behalf of our world today. Can we do that right now? Heavenly Father, we come before you today thankful that you have made us a chosen people, that you have made us a royal priesthood, that we are priests unto God and unto his Father. And Lord, you have given us the great privilege, the great high privilege of being able to pray directly to the Father in the name of Jesus, that the door is open and you said, let us let us draw near unto the throne of grace. You have invited us to come close and to bring our petitions and to pray and intercede on behalf of our world. And God, I thank you that every person that is listening to me right now that is redeemed by the power of Jesus Christ is a priest unto God and can make a difference through their prayers to see that you will move in our land and you will bring healing and salvation and deliverance to those that are lost. Let the watchmen arise. Let the sons of Issachar, let the anointing that was on the sons of Issachar come upon the church today that we would understand the times and we would know what Israel is to do in this hour. Your people are to do. God, we thank you for your goodness and your blessing. We ask your continued help and your continued protection during these dark days in which we're living in. We will not cease to praise you, Lord God, for you continue to be worthy of all worship. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you tonight. I hope that that has encouraged you. I hope that that maybe has brought some understanding and enlightening to you so that you will assume your priestly uh, duties, that you will assume your position as a priest before God and perpetually, day and night, pray without ceasing, uh, pour out that incense on the altar of heaven. Amen. And God will hear and answer prayers. He has promised to do so. And I believe he already is. Amen. Well, God bless you. I love you. God loves you. And we are more than overcomers. And we look forward to the day we can be together. Oh, I forgot to put my timer on. Another great word from Pastor Daniel on how we are all priests in Christ. Now let me go ahead and tell you uh, right away something I know many people are just eagerly awaiting to hear. So what's going to happen with church during the month of April? What's this going to look like for us? Well right now, church family, what I can tell you is that the plan is to continue online for the month of April. As we continue to get more information uh, and as more information is available to us, we will be making other decisions. But for the moment right now, our plan is to continue to come to you uh, via video on Facebook and YouTube. We'll continue prayer at 12 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. We'll continue to do our family altar Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. Uh, we'll continue our Wednesday night Bible study here at 7 p.m. We'll continue our services on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. That'll also be on YouTube and 
Facebook. Uh, I also want to remind you we still have things for the youth and for the kids. The youth have uh, Bible study and Zoom meetings Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Zoom meetings Sunday nights. Our kids have things online as well. So uh, if you're wondering about what all's going on, send us an email, connect with us. Uh, and we want to continue to minister to you. If you have prayer needs, please reach out to us. If you have other needs and, and you just need the church to help you out, please reach out to us and, and anything we are able to do during this time. Uh, we would love to minister to you in those ways. We'll continue to pray for you and pray with you and join us as we are daily in prayer, including Saturdays at 5 p.m., uh, for our nation, for our city, and for our families and our church. Amen.